everyone, it's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy and Profitable Play. And I have an amazing guest expert interview to share with you today. Now, if you follow along with my Profitable Play podcast, and if you don't yet, the link is in the description of this video. But if you follow my podcast, you'll notice that I've been talking a lot lately about expanding your indoor playground or play cafe business. And we've been talking about licensing and franchising and opening additional locations of your own and the pros and cons of each scenario. Now on my podcast, I spent a lot of time talking about franchising and licensing from a current business owner's perspective. So again, somebody with a highly profitable and successful indoor playground business who's looking to expand their reach with an additional location, but isn't necessarily willing or able to operate it themselves. So for whatever reason. I know that when I started licensing my indoor playground, I had a newborn and a toddler at the time, and I just didn't have the capacity either time-wise or just mentally and energy-wise, I just didn't have the bandwidth to operate a second location. But because we were so booked, because we were reaching capacity every day, because our birthday parties were booked out several months in advance, I knew that we could sustain a second location. So again, that's why I went the licensing route. and. That's what we've been talking about a lot on my podcast lately. But in this conversation, we're taking a different approach. So if you are a prospective indoor playground owner or you're somebody that's still in the planning phases and you're kind of, you know, in the place where you're not looking to reinvent the wheel, maybe there is an existing indoor playground business that you admire, maybe it's in your area, maybe it's slightly outside of your area and you're considering entering into a licensing or franchising agreement with them, this video is for you. So in this guest expert interview, I'm chatting with Brian Beers, who owns 30 different brick and mortar franchise locations himself. And he's gonna talk all about that. He's going to talk about what to look for in a franchise program. So again, if you are a prospective owner who's maybe potentially interviewing different uh, indoor playground owners for franchise or license opportunities, or if you're just kind of out there exploring, this is something to definitely keep in mind. He's going to talk about what the process looks like of buying into a franchise, what you can expect to spend, what you can expect to get in terms of initial training and support and ongoing support. And he's just going to give a lot of insight into not only his experiences, but he also has a lot of additional perspective to share as well, because in addition to owning 30 brick and mortar franchise locations himself, he actually coaches and consults with other potential franchise owners and helps guide them along their process and helps them reach profitability a lot faster. So again, he has a ton of experience and insight to share. So I'm so excited to bring you this conversation with Brian Beers. All of his information, his podcast, his Twitter, his website is all linked in the video description. And if you're looking for more information about licensing, franchising, and all that good stuff, I'm going to link to the episodes where I talked about it on my podcast because there is so much more information there. But again, if you are a prospective indoor playground owner and you're considering franchising or licensing or buying into a license or franchise agreement, this is a must-see conversation. All right, let's chat with Brian. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's get right into it. But first, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and who you serve in your business? Yeah, sure. So I'm a, um, my, my primary job is my brother and I operate 30 uh, Midas automotive repair franchises in the Philly, Jersey area. It was a family business. My dad started, uh, grew to about six locations. We joined, I mean, I joined 12 years ago and you know, learn the business and and started having some success. And then, you know, we started acquiring and, and you know, a lot of growth through acquisition, um, which is one of the, one of the, the best parts about franchising is kind of that growth opportunity once you're, once you're inside. And um, so that's my primary job. And then, you know, since I've been, you know, I've got a podcast and I'm pretty big on, on Twitter and uh, you know, I have a lot of people come to me asking for uh, how did, you know, how did they get involved in franchising? What should they look for? What should they look out for? Red flags, all this stuff. And so, yeah, now I uh, have a have a coaching program, and a lot of my content is around teaching people kind of the benefits of franchising, and you know, the challenges, what to look out for, and you know, why someone would choose that path or go down, you know, uh, another path. So, awesome, and we're gonna get into all of that. I'm really excited about this conversation, but let's get started by 
talking about some of the benefits of franchising and why somebody, like you said, might want to go down that path as opposed to opening their own business from scratch. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a couple, the biggest one is kind of the, the, the business in a box, right? So when you, when you buy into a franchise, you're going to pay initial franchise fee. That's like your ticket to, to join. And in exchange for that, they are going to give you, uh, you know, a brand, right? So you're going to, you're going to join whatever brand they have. They already have that established. They've got marketing established. You know, you're kind of another unit in this, this machine that's already there. Uh, a lot of times they do all the marketing for you. Uh, it, it all depends on the franchise, but in a lot of cases, you know, it's, it's your money, but they're going to be directing like SEO, or this is how we're going to do social, or this is how, you know, we're going to be on TV or Pandora or YouTube, all this stuff. So like, most most franchises, you know, ninety five percent of your focus is on operations, and they take care of like the only five percent you would focus on marketing because there's an entire team dedicated to that. And so, you know, along with that, you get buying power, right? So they're going and buying, you know, bigger units of of stuff and and know how to negotiate it, right? If it was like you and independent, like you'd have to not only figure out operations, you'd also have to figure out marketing and branding and all sorts of stuff. But when it gets to the operations side, you know, they provide the the playbook. So like this is like the pricing guide. Right. This is like the point of sale. This is like the best practices in terms of like service officing and, and training. And mm -hmm. you know, you'll spend weeks of training, online training, in-person training, support training, all all depends. Um, and then finally, it's it's there's a community aspect to it. So like, you know, when you join a franchise, you are instantly part of this community of other entrepreneurs who are going down the same exact path as you. And so you know, a lot of it is you you get out what you put in. And so if you're active and in, in the community and you know, you get to get to know other franchisees and you, you become friends with them. And then you, you're on a text group, you know, sharing best practices and wins and, you know, stories about like crazy customers or employees and challenges and all this stuff. And so, you know, you kind of have this environment that um, you're, you're part of something. And so, you know, a lot of it's like speed to scale. You're in the fast lane of growth versus, you know, you, you start from scratch. It's your own thing. It's your own brand, but you're kind of going alone at it. And so it really depends on on what you're looking for. Yeah. And are there any downsides? Because it sounds great from... Yeah. I mean, the, the downsides, remember the, the, the box that they give you and a lot of franchises, you have to live within the box. And so, you know, if if you want to, um, you know, so, so I'm an automotive repair, right? And so we we primarily do, you know, brakes and tires and steering suspension. You know, if I wanted to get into body work or I want to do like car stereos or like all this stuff that's like not really part of, you know, it's Midas, like the brand... I mean, I could probably do one-offs if we have to replace a bumper, but like, if I want to start advertising uh, all over all of the internet, like they would have a problem with that because then customers who see that go to other Midas's and they don't offer those things. And so then it, it creates kind of this, this confusion in the brand. And so a lot of times it has to do with the service offerings. Um, but the funny thing about franchising too, is, is there's this huge spectrum of, of what I, I like to call control where there's some that like you have to operate, they have very tight controls. Like you will wear these clothes, you will operate these hours, you will like they only do these services and they, they treat it more like corporate locations. And then there's this other side of it, which is kind of like where I fall and some other ones that are highly variable where because of fixing cars, like there's so many different things, right? And so many different things um, that could go wrong or types of cars and types of repairs and skill sets of employees that, you know, we have a lot more variability in the things that we focus on. Um, and so- that's one of the, the big, the biggest one that people complain about is like, I want to do this, but they, they won't allow me to do it. Uh, I want to buy another location and the franchisor won't let me because my sales at my current location aren't high enough. Uh, it's, it's, it's that control aspect that, you know, people have to, you know, there's pros and cons to it. So that's, that's like the first one, probably the biggest one. Yeah. And that's something that I hear a lot, but it's good to know that there is some variability in that because one of the concerns that I hear from my prospective students who are thinking about going down that route is, you know, if they're looking to buy into a franchise, but they live in a different area of the country and they want to adapt their business a little bit to what their specific area needs, is it possible to maybe depending on the franchise you buy into have the opportunity to do that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it all depends on the franchise. And, and part of the process is, is what's called, wait, so you'd ask them, you'd find out from the franchise or in terms of like, what's their opinion. And you could give them some examples, right? If you had some ideas and, you know, you know, and probably in your business and like, if, if it's, you know, a, a, 
within the realm of like, we're not like doing this crazy thing that's totally different, but like kind of within the same menu, uh, probably be okay. But but part of it is uh, this step called validation. And so as you go through the process, you will do validation, which means you will talk to other existing franchisees and possibly former franchisees to validate everything that you've heard and learned about the business. So, you know, financial performance and support from the franchisee and you know, is the community thriving or is it like, is it not really? And, and you could ask that question too of, Hey, is there any ideas that like you came up with that they, you know, let you implement or they shot down? And like, so you can validate, even if they're telling you, you know, it's the greatest thing in the world, you can validate all that by talking to as many franchisees as you, you want to. Awesome. So I know you talked about that as one of the steps, but if somebody is considering franchises and they're looking up different opportunities, what is kind of the first step? that, you know, let's say they've narrowed it down to a list of specific franchises that they want to learn more about. What is that first step that they might want to take to start that entire process? Yeah. So I guess it depends where, where they're at. So if they're, if they, if they know it, say they, they, they're listening to this or they, they say, Hey, I like, I like the idea of franchising, but I don't even know where to start period. Right. Uh, there's a couple of different ways. One of them is, yeah, you go online, you can do your own independent research. Um, some of that's really hard though, cause you don't really know you know, I don't know, a lot of these ranking sites, a lot of them are just trying to get your information and, and, and sell it um, to, to, to consultants. And another way you can do it, um, I mean, I, I'm working on building like a community to, to, to help this as well, where, you know, it's an active community and, you know, live group calls and we bring on franchisors too to uh, present their, their model uh, and interview franchisees and all this stuff. Um, but, but getting involved in some sort of group or working with somebody who can then you know, how we do it is, is, you know, get somebody's skills, get their skill set, their goals, their location, and then, you know, kind of take that, that person and then try to try to bring franchise recommendations that match, uh, those things, you know, budget skills, location. And so let's say you got four or five franchises someone brings to you, or you find on your own, whatever. Uh, the first step is, you know, you're doing some sort of intro call with, with the franchise or it's usually like 30 minutes and it's just, a just to make sure you're both on the same page, right? Like that you understand the business model, they kind of get to know you. Um, and then if if that all sounds pretty good and you have a rough idea of like what it costs, right? If it, if it you know, if it's gonna cost $150,000 to open it and you know, you, you can't get the loan, or you don't have the finances, right? It might not be a good fit. Um, and then from there, usually the next step is like a, a, a business model deep dive. So they schedule another call with you. It's about an hour. They got kind of go over the business model at, at, a, at a very deep level. So you really understand it. If that sounds good and, and you still like you're still on board, the next thing they do is uh, send you what's called the FDD, which is, stands for the franchise disclosure document. It's basically the contract that you're going to have to sign when you become a franchisee. And it's like 250 to 500 pages, pages that spells out like, uh, you know, what does it cost? Uh, what are the fees? Like, who are the other franchisees? What are the things you can do and you can't do? Like, like what happens if you default? Like, it's it's the legally binding contract you're to sign. So they send that to you. You have some some time to review it. They set up another call to review it in more detail. If all that sounds good, then you do a leadership call. Where you're talking to like you know the, the founder or like you know other people on the on the leadership team because uh, sometimes you're dealing with like the salespeople. And then if that sounds good. Then you usually do the validation calls. That's when you're talking to the franchisees because now you want to, you know, hear, you know, validate everything you've learned. Um, you know, especially when it comes to the financial side of it, if, you know, what does it cost and how much money you can make? Franchisors are, you know, a, a lot of times they limit what they tell you because they don't want to like make this promise that you're going to make a million dollars and like, you know, you lose money and then you sue them because you didn't make a million. So they, they're very careful with, with the financial side of it. Um, yeah. And then if that all sounds good, usually you do a discovery day or confirmation day, you're flying to headquarters, you're meeting everybody in person. If that sounds good, you're, you know, signing, you're paying the deposit, uh, and then you get kicked off on the, the training process. So it's usually like a seven step process. It could take anywhere from like three, probably three months, um, depends on what speed you move, but maybe, maybe a little sooner. Awesome. So one of the questions that I had, especially because a lot of my students are looking at smaller franchises, so they don't have the quite um, established national recognition as mm -hmm. something like a Midas. So for example, there's a popular indoor playground chain on like the West Coast. Would it be, you know, ill-advised for somebody on the East Coast whose customers or potential customers maybe have never heard of that brand, there's not that recognition, would it be ill-advised to kind of look into that? Because one of the biggest benefits, as you said, is that brand recognition. So is, you know, proximity and recognition to our local community something we should really prioritize? 
I think it really depends on the concept. So like for, for your business, I mean, people are going to seek this out, right? They're going to Google indoor play thing. I mean, I have a six-year-old or whatever. And like, they're going to find one that's local to them, right? They're not going to drive like an hour to go. It's going to be, hey, is it is it local? Does it have good reviews? Does it look clean and modern, right? And then then they're going to go to it, right? It, I, I would imagine a lot of people go to these based off reputation and, and cleanliness, right? Not necessarily, oh, it's like X, Y, and Z brand versus ABC brand, right? Like for the most part, you know, in, in, in some of the major more like food and auto and like some of the more like really, really retail like drive-by stuff, yes, brand matters more than, um, you know, I wouldn't want to be a beer's tire and auto because I think, you know, it'd be hard to compete with it. But in yours, I think it's more of a it's convenience and, and, and reputation side of it. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Uh, what I would be concerned about is, you know, their ability to support somebody that far away. And so we'd be figuring out, you know, if all their franchises are in California and like you're the only one in Philadelphia or, or Miami or wherever, uh, I would I would really want to know, you know, how are they going to support you? How much support do you need, right? Um, in terms of boots on the ground, what kind of commitment can you get from them? Whether it's, hey, I want an, you know, an in-person support, you know, whatever, you know, three days a month for the first X amount of time. Uh, you know, the ways you can validate that is to find out what are the other far ones. So maybe they have another one in whatever Maine and you're in Miami, you know, you're both on the East coast. You're both pretty far away from the home base and, and really figuring out the level of support. That would be the, that'd be what I won't be concerned about. Awesome. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into that, but before we do, I just want to understand the basics because I know a lot of people listening to this are probably just hearing, um, you know, about the concept of franchising and, you know, for maybe the first time, what is a typical, and I know this varies so much, but what is a typical ongoing relationship like between a franchisee and a franchisor? And what I mean by that, is it like daily communication? Is it monthly meetings? Is it when you talk about support, what is something that you think is desirable, I guess, for an ongoing relationship? Like what can we expect at a very basic level? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, spectrum, right? The spectrum of control. Um, with with newer franchises and smaller ones, generally they provide actually a little bit more support because for them, you know, like those early those early franchisees like significantly matter, right? Because, you know, if you only have 10 franchisees and one of them doesn't do well, like it's 10%, like it's gonna be really hard for them to, to grow versus, you know, in the bigger brand, when they have a thousand locations, what's one that, that succeeds or fails. Right. And so that there's some pros and the cons cons there, but, um, you know, in terms of support, yeah, it's going to be a, you know, do they do the marketing? So in terms of roles and responsibilities, like if a lot of times they're like leading all that SEO stuff or, you know, how are they doing social? Like I bet in the playground business, a lot of it would be social driven with like Instagram and TikTok and right Facebook and, you know, who's, who's running that. If, if you as the franchisee have to run it all yourself, right. Or, or are they running that for you? I would, I would definitely want to know that in terms of the support side of it. Um, yeah. Then the communication, it, it all, it all varies. You know, some of them could be as simple as like a WhatsApp chat with like a bunch of franchisees in it who are, who are communicating. Others have more structured, um, you know, every single week you're going to do some sort of call or every single month they do some sort of like KPI review where we're looking into, you know, how many leads do we get? How many, you know, members signed up and how many demos do we do? And, you know, these different, whatever, whatever the criteria is. Um, most of them, when they start, you do have some sort of like business account manager who's somebody who's assigned to you, who's kind of like your point of contact. And so, you know, that obviously that, that first couple of weeks, you're going to be in contact with them all the time. But then as you start to get to know it, I mean, you're not going to need them as much as you understand the software, you understand, you know, Hey, this came up, how do we handle it? You know, after you figure it out, you don't really have that question again. Um, and so in the beginning, yes, it's, you're going to use them a lot. And then as you, you know, after three months, six months, you're really going to have it down. You know, the support level that you are going to even want or need is, is going to dip. And then it might just be more strategic conversations, right. And less like the operational ones. Yeah, absolutely. And something that you said, I want to come back to you about, you know, some cons of investing in a smaller uh, franchise franchise business. Mm -hmm. um, but first, are there any, you know, very basic checkpoints that you look for when you are making a recommendation or considering buying into a potential franchise? Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of the things I'd look for is, um, I mean, how many they've sold versus how many they've opened is is one to look at that's kind of interesting because sometimes you know if they've 
they they sold a ton of them, but they don't have that many open. It would be, you know, where, why is there a bottleneck? And it, and it could be real estate related. A lot of times it is, but then it's a question of, is that just market driven? Or is that like someone at corporate has to physically approve and he's on like a, a 12 month backlog. And so you sign up for this thing and you, and you, you know, you're excited. You want to get going right away. And then you find out like, you're not going to get this thing open for nine to 12 months. Um, and there's like nothing you can do to speed it up. And so that'd be something that I, you really want to look into is, is, you know, the, the sold, but open and then finding out like, what is the bottleneck and, and you know, are they fixing it? Uh, you know, a, a big one is, is like litigation lawsuits. You know, this is a con of franchising is like, you know, if someone closes up, you know, signs a franchise agreement and then closes it up, you know, it all depends on the, the agreement, but the franchisor sometimes does have the right to sue the franchisee for, you know, back payment if they did, weren't paying royalties or potentially even, you know, the term of the contract could have 10 years remaining. They could try to sue you for lost royalties for 10, the next 10 years. And so a lot of that is, is in the FD, that franchise disclosure document, the FDD, there's a whole section on litigation. And so if, if I'm looking at one of them and I see there's a lot of activity of the franchisor suing franchisees, uh, that's like, a, that's for me personally, like that's a huge red flag. Um, you know, there's other times where they will sue a franchise E, but then sometimes it's like they terminate it, but they continue to operate under the Midas brand or whatever after they lost their agreement. So like they have to take them down, right? There's other times where uh, it's, you know, that they, they probably closed up because they weren't profitable and then they're trying to sue them for back royalties. And so there's some specific ones that it's like multiple pages and pages and clearly it's... um you know, their, their business model is, is to turn and burn versus, you know, ideally it's this partnership where both parties are, are helping each other grow. And that's what you want to see. So that's a big one. And then, you know, a lot of it's the validation stuff. Like I'll, you, you only can learn so much by talking to the salespeople and the, 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 the legal agreements. Um, but those are the big ones. Awesome. And I want to give you, I would just want to explain a hypothetical situation that I hear all the time. And then I want to get your feedback sure. on it. So, so many of my students, because most of my members are current indoor playground owners, so they likely have opened one or two locations themselves, and they get approached all the time, whether it's by somebody in their local community, maybe an hour away, or even somebody across the country. And they say, I want to open up exactly what you have. Have you looked into franchising? And, you know, it kind of motivates them to say, you know, is this something for me? Can I do this? Are there any downsides or would you advise kind of becoming that guinea pig or that first franchisee for a newer type of franchise type business? Yeah. I mean, the, the challenges are like, you know, they're going to go through the same gr growing pains, right? Like they don't know what they don't know. So you're like their first one. And then, you know, at, at what level of support can they provide? Because they are like, you know, like they got to run their own business. And a lot of times, you know, these, these franchisors have to have to take on money because they got to like hire a bunch of support people, but then they don't even have royalties coming in to like pay for it. So a lot of times um, there are many, there are about 250, I think new franchisors a year or something like that. And a, a lot of them don't, to be honest, a lot of them don't last. And it's just because it's a whole nother animal and it's a whole nother game. And like, just because you're good at like operating a business doesn't mean that you'd be good at operating a franchise because you go from an operations business to a sales and marketing and like training business and they're like completely different things. And even like for the franchisor, like it's, I mean, it's nice to get royalties and franchise fees, but like franchisees are not, not employees. Like they can do like whatever they want. And, you know, as long as it's once, you know, it all depends on, on, you know, how you enforce things, but you know, if, if they're not doing the things you want them to do, but it's not technically like against your agreement, you, you, they can, you, you don't really have much control over it. Right. Um, and if they're, so that's the challenge I think is that I've, I've talked to other franchisors and I've seen is like, they get really frustrated because like they know what works. This is the system. This is what the person bought into, but they're like completely doing it their own way and not even following the process. And then they're not making money and then they're upset because they're not making money, but then they're not following the process. So it's, you know, kind of this, this, um, this circle. So there's pros and there's pros and cons to it. If someone was just going to have one franchise or two locations, not worth it to me, to, to be honest with you. Uh, I think if someone's going to do it, they're going to have a plan and systems to grow it to at least 20 to 30. So, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just out of curiosity, are there any other kind of commonalities you see among those franchisors that end up failing and end up not working out aside from that 
um, kind of making that transition between, you know, one type of business model versus another? Yeah. A lot of it's like, you know, some of it's, 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 is it, is it scalable? Like, is this thing unique to the area or is it something that can be duplicated? You know, for example, like, I don't know, I've seen ones in like the education space where you have to, you have to hire like a specific teacher with a specific skill set, and for them to, it, you know, it works for them because that, that, you know, the, the owner has relationships with all these schools and these universities and they're able to like, you know, get these students in, but to say, Hey, we're going to like, to duplicate that all around the country to, to attract this very, very tight, you know, specific skill. It's very, it's very hard. And so that, that's a common one I've seen. A lot of it has to do with the, the skill set of the employee that you have to hire, you know, the more skilled they are, the, the less scalable it is. And thus, um, not, not as good as a, as a franchise concept. Um, you know, I think, I think the competitive nature, like a lot of franchises exist in, in, in highly fragmented. So there's like a lot in highly competitive markets. And so, you know, we think food, like there's a million places to get food. There's like house painting, right? There's like, there's all these things where there's like a million people that do it. And so I think having something that differentiates them, that makes it unique and different and, um, is really what stands out, whether that's a new product or a service, whether that is, you know, a proposition, like something like that's, you know, there's just not many, maybe, maybe an indoor playground. I don't know. Maybe there's just like nobody that, that franchises it. And so maybe if you, you, someone is like the only one that does it and they have some sort of uniqueness to it. Um, there are some advantages there, but that, that would be, those would be the big ones. Yeah. And there are a couple existing, especially ones that serve specific communities. So like rock the spectrum is an example. Um, it's an indoor playground concept specifically for autistic children. Mm. Um, so there are some out there, but it's definitely a newer concept. And like I said, it's just seen an explosion over the last couple of years. So let's say that you were maybe consulting with somebody who was considering becoming the first franchisee of a specific business. What are some things that you would encourage them to ask in terms of like financial reporting or systems? Is there anything that you would specifically look for? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first one, that's always the scariest one to be to be honest with you. Um yeah, let me pull up. I have, I have a whole list of questions I, I could actually uh happy to happy to share. Yeah. where it's, you know, an interview question. So, so some of the questions I'd find out are, let me see, and specifically for the first one, uh, I'd want to know about their, 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 their goal, like what the outlook is, like how, how, how do they want to grow this thing? Um, you know, you're obviously the, the first one. So like, it's going to take time. Uh, I'd also, a you can negotiate it. There's a lot of things that are negotiable. The smaller they are, the more that's negotiable. So, you know, they're not going to like, they're not going to reduce your royalties. They're probably not going to reduce your franchise fees. Like some things are set in stone, but you might be able to get like a bigger territory. You might be able to get first rights of refusal for neighboring areas. You might be able to get, um, you know, no, no penalties or whatever, if the thing fails or, you know, there's, there's lots of different things you can negotiate. I'd highly recommend using a really good franchise specific attorney uh, for, for anybody, but especially if it's the first one, they could, they could probably work in, things into there that say, Hey, this, the franchise fails, you know, at a franchise or level, like you would have some protections or you would have the ability to take, maybe, maybe take over the brand or, you know, some things, some things like that. Um, I would find out specifically training. I'd want to meet all the people like who are going to be providing the training because those are the ones you're going to be working kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and yeah, I would, I would want to find out, obviously have they, um, what kind of support they they assist in, in the real estate side of it, especially in your business. I mean, finding the the I don't you know what ten thousand square foot place or whatever it is, you know, probably in more of a industrial like you need somewhat of a low lower cost per square foot. Um, so how much how much are they going to help you there? Like, is somebody going to fly out? Are they going to find stuff? Are they going to you know really assist with that, or are you kind of on your own? And so that's the that's the biggest one. It's the training and the support and like you know you really have to trust them. Cause at that point, I mean, you're, you, there's no track record, right? Like you're believing in that person, the, the founder and, you know, the, the more time you can spend with them you know, to really understand them. And, and tr that, that's what it is. I mean, you, you're, you're betting on that person more than you're betting on the brand. Cause there is no brand. There is no, there is no like systems. Like it's whatever the guy created and he's going to do his best to get it applied to you. Um, but I mean, I have friends that have been the ninth franchisee in, in brands and, you know, like 
very good founders, weekly Zoom calls, like, you know, text chat, like they're helping them post ads and, and hire people and, and do all these things and, you know, building, building very quickly. And so uh, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, 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 it's very different than if it's, you know, you're the, the 50th or the hundredth or the, the thousandth. So. Yeah. So just a quick question as a follow-up from that. If somebody comes to you and says that they're thinking about opening a, you know, as a franchisee, would you recommend that they go into that with the mindset that they're ultimately going to own multiple locations or can somebody make, you know, a sustainable, decent living, just owning one location, or should we always be thinking bigger? Really depends on the individual and, and their individual goals. Some people only want lo one location and they, you know, they want to manage a small team and it's like, you know, it, it could be a lifestyle side of it, right? Where you're making extra money, but you're not, you know, you have good hours, right? Like you have time with your family, you have flexibility. You know, some people are going it, it, at, at it because they want to replace, you know, a job. They want more freedom. I mean, obviously there's more like, you know, weight on their shoulders and, and employees and all this stuff. Uh, and then there's other people that get into it and they say, Hey, I want to build like a pretty big business. I want, you know, I want five locations, 10 locations. I want to, I want to own the whole market. And I want to like, you know, grow this thing, whether it's this or a cleaning business or home healthcare or whatever it is. Right. Um, and I want to, I want to make, you know, uh, a ton of money. I mean, franchising is a scalable business. It, I mean, it depends on the concept, right. As we kind of talked about some are more scalable than others. Um, but I mean, in franchising, there's guys that run a hundred, you know, one unit, five units, 10 units, a hundred units. The biggest one in the country has, you know, over 2000, you know, restaurants that they operate, like bigger than publicly traded companies. And so, you know, full spectrum there. And it really just depends on the individual and what their goals are. Uh, and then making sure they find a franchise that matches, you know, those goals. And, you know, if, if you want something that's very scalable, but you find a franchise that every single franchisee has one, probably not something that's scalable versus you get into something where the average person is three or four, there's guys with 10 or 20, uh, something that, yeah, the road has already been paved for you, right? So easier to easier to go down. Yeah, one quick question before we wrap up. Have you ever seen, I know we talked about litigation in terms of the franchisor suing the franchisee. Have you ever seen it the opposite way where the franchisor doesn't hold up their end of the agreement, doesn't provide the support yeah. that they were promised? Is there, as there are situations that you've seen where that's happened? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are also disclosed, you know, in the, in the FDD where they'll state that they, um, you know, they, they failed and they're suing them for $150,000 or, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, some, sometimes they provide as much details as I guess they're, or the minimum details that they, they have to provide, but, uh, it'll, it'll show that, you know, that we settled or that, you know, we had a judgment for this. Um, so you can, you can find, and all those are public too, since, um, you know, so you can, you can read the court documents if you, if you really wanted to. Uh, but yeah, that, that does, that does, that does happen. Um, yeah, in it, they, they're supposed to show all current, uh, pending and past, uh, litigation. And so other benefit of a franchise attorney too, is, you know, they can also dig in to ensure that there's nothing that was excluded that should have been in there. Um, especially with s smaller ones, right. Or ones that have been whatever, maybe trying to hide it. Uh, the bigger guys, obviously like, you know, a little bit, a little bit harder for them. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the huge part of it is the due diligence and ensuring that, you know, it's a solid, it's a solid partnership because that's what it's all about. Yeah. And one, one last question. I just keep thinking of these random questions that I get a lot, um, for people that are kind of having trouble getting a loan for a startup business because there's no years of tax returns to show. Have you seen people that have struggled with getting loans for startups in the past, have an easier time if they're buying into a franchise model? Yeah, I mean, in in general, the you know the, the SBA is is friendly towards uh, franchises. Um, you know, usually you know they'll loan like sixty five to seventy percent of the startup costs. Um, so you have to come with you know thirty five thirty percent of it. Yeah. But as part of that includes the franchise fee, some working capital. Like you know, it's not just hard costs. There's there's they help with the soft costs too. You know, on the the, the downside is you you do have to have some assets to be able to put up. So if you're getting a loan for $150,000, like they want collateral that's equal to the loan. So if you, if you own a house and you have at least, you know, if you have 200,000 of equity in the house, you know, your, your house is going to be put up as, as collateral um, to cover it. And so that's, that's the challenge of the SBA is it's good, but if someone doesn't have a lot of assets, um, th they would have trouble qualifying unless they have a co co borrower on that, who, who does have the assets. Um, that's one way, you know, the, the, 
so, uh, there's a bunch of ways to finance it. Sometimes franchisors will provide some in-house financing, specifically on the franchise fee, sometimes equipment if they provide it. Um, there's other third-party lenders that will do unsecured personal loans if someone has good credit, like you know over 700 and and a track record of 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 income, you know they'll loan them unsecured, meaning you don't have to put up any assets, but you know much higher fee. I mean we're talking 10% interest rate, like much higher fees, but unsecured most likely you can pay them off like once the business is going. Obviously there's risk there, but um, there's a benefit to some people. You know other people if they have a a, a brokerage account like an and Fidelity or Vanguard, uh, a lot of those will do um, called margin loans. So like you can borrow against the value of your stocks without having to sell them. So you don't like incur capital gains. Uh, if someone has a 401k and they're quitting their job, there is a way that you can roll over a 401k. Uh, it's called ROBS to then to fund the business. Uh, and then, you know, there's no like early withdrawal penalties or anything. There's a bunch of rules around that. You obviously want to use, use an expert there, but yeah. Um, you know, there's HELOCs, like I've seen that too. So that 200,000 of equity someone has in their home, getting a HELOC is a much better deal and much, much easier than, you know, going with the SBA. And so there's lots of different ways people do it. I've, I've seen them stack stack it in different ways, um, you know, friends and family too, if if you want to go down that road. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the the benefit is there's, there's many different ways you can do it. Awesome. So just to kind of wrap up um, and before we learn where we can learn more about you and what you offer to potential franchisees, um, do you have any last words of advice for somebody maybe considering going down this path? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for a lot of people that just don't know that franchising provides like all these opportunities, people think starting a business, maybe they think about real estate, um, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I think there's a ton of benefits. A lot of it's the fast lane and like, you, you want to go fast, you go, you, you go together. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there's downsides. Like there's a lot of franchises are good. There's some that aren't good. There's some that are bad apples. I think, you know, really, really finding one and doing that really good due diligence. And, and, you know, like I said, you're signing like a 10 year partnership with somebody. And so as, as much as like, there's all these benefits I, and I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm pretty good at talking about that, you know, there's, there's concerns too. And so I, that's the, the big part is like, I want to make sure people are protected. And I think franchising is great. You can build, build, you can make a ton of money. You can build a ton of wealth. You can, you know, has good exit value. Cause like, you know, it's a franchise established brand. It's, you know, you can get a higher valuation. Um, and so tons of good stuff, but there's a lot of landmines too. And so I think there's just a lot to learn. Uh, and so I think getting started and, and starting to immerse yourself um, is, is the best way. Awesome. So if anyone is intrigued and, you know, they want to learn more about you and what you offer, where is the best place to follow you? Yeah. So I'm a couple different things. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter, uh, at Brian beers, um, like drink and brianbeers.com. I just launched a uh, introduction to franchising coaching program. And so what's included in that, I've got a course, which is kind of like this, you know, everything you need to know from startup costs to due diligence to, you know, market research and, and franchise fees and all this stuff. And we're doing live calls. So, you know, coming on once a week to do live calls, you know, that I'll host with questions, specific franchises, the due diligence, you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about today. Uh, I'm bringing on franchisors to do live webinars. And so I'm going to invite, I don't know, 10, 10 or so per month. They're going to come on. They're going to like pitch their concept, their costs, um, performance, whatever they're, whatever they want to say. Those are all recorded too. So like people can go back and watch them, uh, doing live interviews with franchisees, doing a group chat, uh, and then personalized franchise matching. So when somebody then is ready to say, Hey, I've, I've learned all this stuff. I want to start, take that next step. I want to talk to franchisors. You know, our team works with them. Uh, it, it doesn't cost anything to to do this um, for the matching side of it, and to make the introductions and then working with someone th throughout the process. And so um, they can go to brianbeers.com. They can find out about that. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a membership to be part of it. And um, yeah, I'm I'm excited. We just we just launched that, so it's gonna be great. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And and hopefully everyone uh, good luck in their journey and learning about franchising. All right. Thank you. All right, that wraps up my conversation with Brian Beers. I hope you found it as helpful as I did. And again, all of Brian's contact information, if you're interested, is linked in the video description. And if you want to do a deeper dive into licensing and franchising and opening additional locations of your own, again, whether you are a current indoor playground owner or a prospective indoor playground owner, I'm going to link to all of my additional resources and episodes and premium resources and courses and all that good stuff in the video description as well. So if you have any questions or need anything clarified, you can also feel free to comment. And my Instagram profile, please feel free to reach out and connect there, is also linked in the video description. 
All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a video.